today was or today is Audrey's birthday, and so uh, I, I was I got on Facebook earlier to look up, tr- try and put a face to a name that was in an email, and it like alerted me to a memory. And so oh. the memory for today was the picture of me holding her as a newborn in the hospital, and then one of Danya. And I look, I was like, we were children. I know. They let like I just I, I and then I, I recalled you know Spencer's the oldest, but like taking him home. And thinking, I can't believe they let us take a child home. I know. Yeah. Luckily, like kids are like have. super resilient because right. yeah. like <laughs> it's it's sketchy yeah. at best. How about whenever your kid sees a picture of you from that time, they're like, whoa. Whoa. What happened <laughs> they're like, to you? whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what happened? You happened to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and about 2,000 like good meals and hamburgers That's and right. steaks. Yeah. And it's an investment. Just blame yeah. on my kids though. Yeah, <laughs> you happened to me. That's why I look this way. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. So here we are again. We've wrapped up Acts. Although, the, help, let's refresh because I, I don't know that I have the, oh, I got the, the thing, the bookmark on me. We we finished all of Acts last time, yeah. And then we skipped Psalm 25. So we're still right. We're just only working through two chapters okay. today. Yeah. So we're on schedule now. So when they go to read this, mm-hmm. when they listen to this, on Saturday or Sunday, they will be at the end of Romans Psalm. two. Romans two, not Acts Romans two. two. Yeah. So today is intro to Romans. Yeah. Oh, and says Psalm five, but I didn't read Psalm five. I'm not gonna lie. You know, I didn't either. I didn't either. I just oh, went good. through Psalm. Through <laughs> so Romans. Y'all, we're I'm all, so worried about we're Romans. All yeah. So about Romans. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Is Psalm five really on there? Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll read that at the end. We'll see how long it is. And Lance we can, made short, that book. We can conclude Psalm with I, that. Then we get a time to say okay. Psalm yeah. 5 is short. Okay, we'll get to it. All right, so Romans. Let, let's get a little bit of the setup of it. D- this definitely, yeah. I mean, when I got even those two chapters, it took me way longer to do one chapter than it did to do like when I had to catch up on multiple days. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. So let's talk, let's get into Romans. I know, do you got a lot of books here? I so know, I brought a lot of books. I mean, it's just mostly Bibles. Just start reading from book. them. No. <laughs> <laughs> this guy says this thing. Uh, yeah. All right. So we are switching from narrative into letters. That's a big liter- literary shift. Like you, we, ha- we have a lot of work to do just to get our minds in the right place. So that's what I brought all this stuff for is the work that it takes for me to switch mm-hmm. into like, all right, what's happening here? And so- How so, do we read it differently? Because yeah. we, we really, we read different genres differently. Yep. And this is a letter- and you don't read the same way as a narrative, which is what we've been in. Yeah. So let's even break that down again, because I want to okay. make sure I'm thinking of it the right way. Maybe there's some other people who, like me, are like, okay, what is it? So narrative is... A story. Story. Biographical, even, about Jesus, yeah. mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the Gospels are. And then Acts is about the story of the church, and it follows Paul and Peter and the other apostles. And that's different to a letter in that... So Luke even says in both of his books that we've read now that it, he, he gathered all of these stories so that there was an accurate account. He's trying to create an account. Whereas when we now are switching to the letters, this is an actual letter written to a group of people. It's not trying to record events or any of that. It's, he's disseminating information, commanding asserting all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what does that, like how does that influence how we not just read it, but how we, uh, is that in the apply? Is that, like, what does that influence in our bread, I guess? Oh, that's good. Oh well, man, that's a deep question. Yeah, that's that one is. like- w- You'd have to go through all of them almost, but- Well, here's, man, you're, you're already jumping bread. into- Sorry. No, 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 see, okay, no, I don't need to see bread. Okay. The, <laughs> I, I, I figured it. we were going to talk about this later in the podcast, but we'll okay, jump right sorry. in. All right, here's the deal. When, with something like Romans, which has all of this theology in it, is because of the way we're wired and because of our focus on, which is a good focus, on systematic theology and doctrines, we can read a chapter of Romans and be like, all right, here's the theology I've got to get out of this or the belief. And so we, we pick something to work on and Sometimes it's removed from its place in a letter to people and a context and what it's written about and why it was written. So the, the danger, in fact, I wrote mm. this quote down, is um, we, we can approach these letters with an assumption that what it means to me in English must be its natural basic meaning. 
Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. So we need to we need to know the context so that we can grab the actual meaning. Okay. So I just want to like piggyback on that because that's so helpful and important because for any letter, you're this there's one person writing to another person or peoples. So they're writing for an occasion. We call it occasional. And so you have to know the historical context, the cultural context, where are they writing, why are they writing, what question are they answering, and it's one side of a conversation. So we have to sort of figure out what is the context in order to interpret it the right way. But Romans in particular is tough because like Lance said, it really has so much theology in it that it's a letter, but it's a really long one and it's dense. It's like the densest letter. And so it's tempting to read it just as theology, but it's really a letter. So we have to still read it like a letter. So I guess, how are we supposed to know then as the reader of like, what can you take as like, this is like, oh, but this is like, no, you got to understand the context of this one. Is there a general rule? Is it like, a, well, it just depends on which yeah, part it, you get it depends. To. It really depends. Okay. There's not an answer to give, I don't think. No, there's not. Um, but, but I would say you, you always want to go through the context first, mm-hmm. no matter what you're reading. So even with Acts, even though it's a narrative, we wanted to know, okay, where are we? What's going on? Yeah. What are the other things that we know? Who are the, who's the author? And it's the same thing with the letter. You always want to do that. And that gives you just a foundation to then figure out how to read through this letter. But I think one rule of reading letters in general is it's helpful to read the whole thing through because it was written as a letter. So there's one idea running all through it. So when we went through Acts, it was like, there's this story and then this story, and then we changed gears and it was this section. This is one thought process, one, there's an argument and there's a letter running through all of Romans. And so when you section it out without context of everything else, you can be tempted to just pull verses like, oh, well, this might mean this. Right, and it's so quotable. Yes. The letters are, yeah, yeah they're, it seems like easy to understand, easy to apply, and it, that's not bad. It's not wrong. You just have work to do. Yeah, there's just a little bit of work. But I think treating it as a whole is really important. So let me ask you a practical question. This may be like, eh, we don't actually know, and that's fine. But if Paul is in... the, the I read somewhere this, you know, Paul, after some missionary journey back in Acts, this is when he writes the letter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To his third one. I saw you yeah, trying to be like yes. subtle, like, <laughs> it's okay to call me. I was like, no, dude, it was it's, after it was his, his third, third missionary, missionary journey. journey. They think he wrote it from Corinth. Okay. So how does Paul know enough about the context of what's going on there to give them all this, like, deep, rich stuff? Is there, like, letters going back and forth? Is he just hearing it based on, like, reports so that he's hurt? Like how? Yeah, that, uh, yes. That's a great All question. That. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is the first letter we come to in the New Testament, but it's not the first letter he wrote. This is actually one of his later works. So he's been developing over the decades a way to communicate all these deep truths. And so what we have in Romans is his longest letter. So the, the letters are not arranged chronologically. They're arranged by length. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. fun fact. So that's why Romans is first. It's his longest letter. And as we read them, they, they get shorter. That's just the way that's, it is. That's the way they're organized, but that's not always as helpful yeah. mm-hmm. when, when you're just like picking up and we're going to read it cover to cover, right? The, the Bible. So knowing that, like, okay, these are theological concepts. These are truths that he's been developing for a long time. Uh, and, and because this was written later, it's probably going to have a more developed idea than something that he wrote early on. Like Galatians was probably mm-hmm. his first the first thing that he wrote. And you can see whenever we get to those letters, you will, because it's so helpful to be reading these back to back and back because you can see where he's pulling from those letters in Romans. This is really like, people think this is like his manifesto. This is like his, 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 all of his work combined. And so we're really getting like all of Paul's theological thought and work in this one letter. Yep. That's what's kind of cool. Just even hearing that, this idea of like knowing Paul's, journey of like being called to be a voice to the Gentiles and like it culminating with, you know, in Rome is where he was, he he longed to go. And that was like the end. And this is the one that's the most, uh, yeah, his letter to that. I mean, you're talking about the context. So that's the historical context, which we've talked a little bit about next, but. Well, we need, uh, we need a ton of historical context to understand Romans because you, you ask, how can he know the problems that exist? The, a lot of the problems were widely known. 
So if it, the occasion for Romans is that in uh, 49 AD, Emperor Claudius expelled all of the Jews from Rome, which was a, a city of about a million people. Because of problems with... Yeah, because of problems with... Similar named to Christ. The Christos, yes. Christus uh, in Latin. Oh, it was similar to his name. No. Wait, what? So... G- G- yeah, Jesus Christ, okay. similar to the Christ. So, I mean, just I, I just think about Acts. Like, think about all the work we've been doing in Acts. All of those, like the rebellions and the mobs and the and the all those conversations. Those are happening everywhere. So right. wait, go back one okay. second because I'm I, I lost you then okay. because of his name because of Christos. Yeah. So here it is. So there were Christians in Rome. No one knows who started the church in Rome, it, but Christians ended up there, and. Uh, there, there began to be a lot of problems between the Jews. And they said in the, in the historical records, it was related to Crestus, which most people think means Christ, the Latin for, for Christ. So the Jews were what, what Rachel's uh, referencing back in Acts. When we would read, Paul would go into a town and go to the synagogue and talk about Jesus. And some people would have a positive response and others would have a negative response and stone him or whatever. Like that happened in Rome to the point where uh, Claudius said, the Jews are kicked out of here. We can't do this anymore. Yeah. And so they, they left. And five years later in 54 AD, when his reign ended, Nero was the next um, leader there in Rome and allowed Jews to come back. Paul wrote about, I think, three or four years after that. Is that right? Yep. About five years after that. So it's really, this letter. it's all the, this letter, it's yeah. the, the, it's like the Jew Gentile problems and questions we were talking about all throughout Acts and the political connotations yeah. too. They're saying, Jesus, right, Christos, like that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Lord, the King, the King. The King. So that's all in Rome, there's all sorts of problems with that. So they were just the Jews because that's where it came from. They were just kicked out because of the fear of rebellion and overthrow and all those things. So early on, these first two chapters, we, we read a couple of times where Paul says to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Uh-huh. He's addressing both of these people groups. So imagine you have a, uh, Christianity has come out of the Jewish faith. It originates there, but then all of these Gentiles, Greeks, come to have faith in Jesus. Then imagine taking all the Jewish people out for five years. And now you have just a Gentile church. And they're house churches. So it's like, it's like a network of Christians in, in Rome and they're growing. And then all of a sudden Jews began to show back up. What differences might you think they oh, yeah. bring to the table? What, what, uh, though they are united in Christ, they have different things pulling them away. So the Jews would have the tradition of the law in the Old Testament and the Greeks would have the tradition of paganism and temple worship and all of those things. So now you have these competing factions that are struggling to get along, even though... They're united in Christ. That's crazy. That's the occasion yeah. for this. Yeah, letter. that's the occasion. And Paul's like evident longing to go to Rome. Yeah. I mean, I think you can just see his his love for them in this introduction. And he's also hoping that they're going to be a base for what he wants to continue in Spain. He wants them to provide money for those Jews in Israel. And he also is hoping to continue his ministry. So do you... I guess maybe we don't know this, but when Paul would write these letters, is this the only letter we we would think like he would write to the church in Rome, or this is just the one that's made it through time that's a part of the canon of Scripture, or I don't know. There, there is not textual evidence for there being other letters. Okay, where where like in Corinthians we have First and Second Corinthians, but it's clear in when you read those two, there's a third letter. Yeah. We don't have that. I don't think there's clarity here. Yeah, I, I don't think there is either. I don't think we can like say for sure, but I, but I will say that, so when we say letter, it's sort of like, we think of like an email, right. or yeah. like I'm gonna write you a postcard. This is a very, this is like a, this is a very well thought out document. Yeah. So he's using even like rhetorical devices that they yeah. use during that time to try to convince them of something. So it's, it's really something he worked on for a long time that was very official and specific. Yeah. All right. Th- that segues into, I brought, uh, I have this NIV Cultural Background Study Bible. Mm-hmm. It's one I, I keep on hand just for like context, yeah. cultural context. Uh, one of the contributors is John Walton, who's an Old Testament Hebrew scholar, a uh, big fan of his. But it, 
That's when you cool. get into Romans, it's got this little page about ancient letters. It says, in the ancient world, communication was difficult and costly. Writing materials were expensive, and conveying these letters to their intended recipients took time and effort. Uh, so as a result of all this, the average letter in this time typically was 87 words. Mm-hmm. This one is 7,000 words. Yeah. Yo. So the, the estimated cost uh, back in like 2016, whenever this Bible was published, uh, would be about, let's see, something like $2,000 in early 21st century U.S. currency, the cost for the writing materials to, to publish Romans and send it. Yeah. So the church in Corinth, they're probably doing stuff contributing yeah, to allow absolutely. him to do this. Yeah, That was part of know. the ministry. That was, yeah. that was his ministry. I mean, he says, I, wanna pre- I can't wait to preach the gospel to you, and then he proceeds to do it in this letter. So, I mean, it's, this was a foundational part of what he was doing. Yeah. Anything else beforehand, before we get into that we need to talk about, about reading Romans or the setup of it, the book of Romans? I, do you have something? I know the letter. Okay. I guess that was so confusing. Now. I'm so it excited a, about is a, side Atlantis. It, <laughs> do what? It's bouncing. <laughs> no, man, I just... No, I, I know. Uh, man, I want to approach this the right way, and I get nervous because Romans is a big deal. Oh, yeah. And I just want to understand it right. So... Um, Scott McKnight, who's a New Testament scholar, wrote this book called Reading Romans Backwards. Have you read this? No. Okay. I think Aaron and I talked about this. Probably. Okay. Uh, he makes a case for not actually reading Romans backwards, although I guess he does, but that if we really want to understand Romans best, it's helpful to have the end of it in mind when we start reading at the beginning. And so he recommends reading it in three chunks. First, you start with chapters 12 through 16, which, which are the last four chapters then chapters 9 through 11, and then go back and read 1 through 8. Now, I'm not t- saying tear up your Bible plan and change all that, but the, ca- the reason he's saying that is because it, he starts out with conflict. Like he's, he's trying to address something. But when you get to the end of the letter, it's very pastoral. And you see actually what it is he's, uh, who he's talking to rather, and uh, how it's all rooted in Christ. And then in chapters uh, 9 through 11, he, he talks about the way God has been working. So if you can get the end of the book in mind, the end of the letter, it helps you process what's said at the beginning. Yeah. So, so maybe yeah, a little I, heads up would have been better next time. <laughs> maybe before we like get into this. Before, yeah, go read 12 yeah. through 16. Go read those well, first, yeah. then start. I, I would say even if you, can, if you can just read 15 and 16, um, if you have time to listen to 15 and 16 and then, and then to start studying at the beginning, that would be really helpful. And it's not just because there's so much going on in Romans. It really is long. Yeah. So it's hard to just read it straight through. Like if you're reading Colossians or Philippians, you can just read that through, but this takes a little bit more time. But if you read those last two chapters, it's helpful. Ha- have the end in mind. Yeah, yeah. And it is very dense. I noticed like the first day yes. one, I like just the first, I don't know how many, you know, seven verses I was like 20 minutes in just on those, like, anyway. Just in his, like, salutation. He's like, yeah. His greeting. There's so, yeah, the greeting yeah. Where, where he lays out the, the gospel there. Um, well, so I'll just say this, um, just to, to tag along with, like, reading the beginning and the end together, just to maybe give just one of the many focuses. One is the, is the Jews and Gentiles and unity in the church because there's discord and he's trying to find unity within these people because it's the same gospel, it's the same Lord, all those things, which he's going to talk about. Um, he, actually, he actually has this phrase that's in uh, chapter one and chapter 16. So let me see. Um, where is it? Here it is. Uh, so in five... Th- so Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And then he says the same phrase in the very end of Romans. In Romans 16, in the very last couple of verses, he says, uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed into the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever the more through Jesus Christ. So you can even just see in the, you know, the last sentence of this first section and then the last sentence of the whole book, like there is one theme that you can see, the obedience of faith. Yeah. 
And that's a little bit just even people. hearing that, reading that. It's like, hey, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And then at the very end, he's right. like, look, I exactly. just did it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mic yeah. drop. What does it look like to have faith that leads to obedience? You want to say more about that, Rachel? I see it on your face. No, no, I don't. I think we're going to do that all we throughout Romans, that, yeah. but I just maybe just bear that in mind. Because, yeah. And yeah. that's why it's helpful. Like, you're not necessarily going to know all the answers if you start at the end and, and then go back to the beginning. But that's definitely one of the themes is what does it look like to have a faith that leads to obedience? What does it look like to have Jesus as your Lord? Yeah. All right. What, what, what do you. <laughs> this, this is going to be so hard, I think, for some. I feel like overwhelmed because so much of it we read, like, okay, so like, what does this, I, I mean, is this really, there's times mm-hmm. where it feels like, oh man, this is speaking really yeah. to me. But then you're like, it's a bag because it's like, whether a conviction thing, like, oh, is this really, uh, a, is this really applied to me or is this applied to the, the, the general context here of like, do, do, am I falling into this category of, you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, guess it does. No, yes. Yeah. It, it, what makes Romans challenging is exactly what Rachel brought up because it's about our obedience in many ways. Now, the, all of that is rooted in what's been done for us, who God is, how he has worked, and what that means for our lives. But ultimately, it, it means obedience, a faith that has real practical um, actions in our lives. And, and so I, I read this and I just, mm. I, I became aware that the next couple of weeks as we work through this are going to really hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, um, so I had just had like four big things written down that I just sort of like, okay, this is what I've got to be thinking about whenever I walk through the rest of it. One is unity in the church, because that definitely matters for us. It might be a different question, but we, we still have to be unified for the purpose of bringing glory to the name of Jesus. Because he even says uh, in 2.24, he says, for as it is written, and this is a quote from Isaiah, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And he's talking to the Israelites. He's talking to the Jews. But I mean, he's talking to the people who are supposed to be the light to all the nations who are supposed to represent God. And so... I think that's to me one thing that I'm like, for sure, that's what we're called to do now. Yeah. Is the name of Jesus, are we a light or are people blaspheming the name of God because of well, he's, how we act? He's calling them out through, all throughout chapter yeah. two because they, they're being very judgmental toward mm-hmm. the Gentiles because they've come back into Rome and they're like, you guys aren't being circumcised and you're uh, participating in pagan temple. You know, like they're, they're criticizing mm-hmm. their Gentile counterparts, but being judgmental about it. Right. And so that's not being a light. Yeah. It's, it's actually not helping the church. It's creating yeah. a division. And so usually um, in scripture, when the you is plural, it's, it's to everybody. Y'all. It's y'all, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, hey, y'all. Uh, whenever he begins chapter two, whenever he starts talking to, you know, because these are like we've talked about a lot. These are his people. He is so sad and frustrated with the Jews. And he says, therefore, you have no excuse. That's singular. That is individual. So it's this very emphatic. How do we know that? I remember Yancey gave that sermon. Like, how do we know the difference between the yous that are just you singular and the you plural? How like how would one figure? How would one? They learn that? they have different words, but we don't have the right translation. For yeah, but it. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. How do how do we go to oh. find that out? Even like, is that like a transcripts? Yeah, uh, like a, a, key, a commentary. A, yeah, okay. can help you with that if it's a, a more oh, scholarly one. Yeah. Um, you can use Bible software programs like Blue Letter Bible is a free one online. Uh, Logos is uh, one of the more popular programs yeah. you can purchase. But I guess you could just, I want to say, you could just Google like, hey, is this you plural in this verse or something? Or it would maybe you know, tell you, you. You really might be able to yeah. because there's yeah. just so many resources online. But but what's even better is finding a commentary that you trust yeah. that's helpful because then you know what you're reading. But that's I, like, just, I like my Bible with the red letter Jesus. Like you know, I like mine with the blue U's and the green U's, the ones that are for y'all and the ones yeah. that are for you. Well, and it doesn't really matter, right? You can read this and think it's y'all, and it's still it's fine. Right? Like yeah. we all because we all are. That's actually the point. Yeah. But it does it does it should draw us to personal reflection. Yeah. Because that doesn't really happen very often in the Bible because it's a collective faith. It really is. It's for us. We're a family. It's for everyone. But this is, hey, you have no excuse, dude. Yeah. Like nobody. 
And so that to me was very convicting. Like, okay, and it's a long list and these lists of sins, you can definitely find yourself. Well, yeah, so that, that brings me to like the, the first place maybe I can get into, but talking about this idea and starting in verse. My wife says, I say every time I can't see, she's like, you got to stop saying that. I'm <laughs> like, stop saying I'm that. Yeah, I gotta stop saying that. Well, it's a magnifying glass. I said, I'm just going to get a magnifying glass <laughs> and sit here, but it's starting in verse 18, uh, d- just through the rest of... Uh, chapter one. So this idea that, um, you know, God's kind of putting a corral in around how it's like, dude, it's, it's ultimately like everybody. They don't, every they, human, every human. Every yeah. Human. Um, so I think that was, and maybe we just, you know, we recently heard that sermon about, you know, what about, uh, people who have never yeah. heard? Well, mm-hmm. this is like saying to a certain extent, well, everyone's kind of hurt. I mean, his creation has been, uh, proclaiming, yeah. yeah. Creation proclaims God's handiwork. Yeah. Is that Psalm 19? Yeah. Also, if you think back to Acts, whenever Paul was preaching the gospel to his Jewish companions, and then he would also preach it to the Gentiles with Acts 17. This reminded me of that when I was reading it. He starts out in, in the beginning of Romans, talking about, oh, he's a descendant of David, and he was promised by our prophets. And then he gets here, and he's talking about Gentiles. And it's sort of the reverse, though. It's not like, hey, you know who he is, so worship the right one. It's, hey, you know who he is, so you have no excuse. But if you, if you read, you said, uh, so if you look at verse 23, 123, or even 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So that's idolatry, right? You're exchanging yeah. God for creation. But that, what, what does creeping things and birds and animals make you think of? Idols. Yeah. Genesis 1. Though. Yeah. Gen- it's yeah. like the oh, language the the creation. Yeah. from creation. And yeah. so that's, to me, really important, too, is he's really starting this, this proclamation of the gospel in Romans all the way back in creation, because that was the promise, right? Yeah. This is what he created. And then it's this inverse. You're supposed to be worshiping me, the creator, and really ruling over the animals and creeping things. And instead, you're you're ignoring me and rebelling against me and you're worshiping yeah. who you're supposed to be ruling. That's what he backwards. says the next two verses. Therefore, God gave them up yeah. in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Yeah, so it's definitely garden language. But I think even before that, where I, not struggle, but it, it really got me thinking was this idea that uh, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and all things that have been made. It's like this idea is so clearly perceived. It's like maybe it, it is clear, but I've clouded be, maybe because of broken, you know, the, the brokenness of the world. But it's like, man, I think, before I became a Christian, it didn't seem like it was so clear. So, yeah, I think, I mean, that's a whole conversation, but yeah. I think the attributes of God, the beauty and justice, and, you know, all of those things, all yeah. the his characteristics are clear, but not necessarily the, the gospel, not necessarily yeah. how he saves us. And then it gets to the end of this, you know, this whole list of all these things. It's like, dude, I, you know, I tried to underline, I'm like, dude, this is like everybody. It's like only Jesus didn't, like everybody can find themselves somewhere Mm -hmm. uh, in this. But then it's like, uh, I guess maybe that's answering the same question, this idea I wrote. And so like, how do they know? Because though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So at the end, I guess that's just affirming like, you guys all in some way or another are participants in the brokenness of... Yep. Right. All right. And I, th- I think really just this, these two chapters, because th- this is a lot Romans, but these two chapters really invite self-reflection, yeah. you know, um, for are, are we unified as a church? Are we judging other people? Are we actually examining what we're worshiping? Are we finding idols in our own lives? I mean, there's a lot of self-reflection that we can pray over and bring before God and pray with our small group about because the right the message gets better. This is, you know, all these things are deserving of death. I think it says that in this section, which again goes back to Genesis when, you know, the wages of sin is death. And so I think we should 
especially this That's week, romance. especially this week. That's later on in Romans. Well, it's, yeah. I it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, it is later on in If you eat this right. fruit, you yeah. shall surely die. That's right. It all goes back to, to that problem, and it is a humanity problem and a Jewish problem. And that's really what he's saying. And I think this is a really good week to be reflecting on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think what what we will find, maybe you guys will just find with me as we go through the letters, is this continued draw back to the beginning, back to mm-hmm. Eden, back to the ideal, to help understand what it is the church is being told in these letters. So... Yeah. So let's jump to two where it's like the law of the law of the law of the law. Get, help give, and I, I, you know, you look in the cheat notes, as a guy in my group likes it, and I think that helps give some context, but maybe like help break that down for this idea of uh, the laws that pl- applies to the, the Jews in this context and then the non law that, because then they were law unto themselves. Yeah. Of so, the Gentiles. So again, he, he's talking in part of this to the Jews who hold on to this idea that we were given the law. This is the way you're supposed to live. And so they're trying to always bring the law into the story of Christianity, not that it should be removed, but they're trying to to push the law onto the Gentiles, onto the Greeks. And the law just mo- is the Mosaic law? Correct, like yes. Circumcision, circumcision, kosher laws. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of food and circumcision, those are the... Mm-hmm. Those are those are signs that you're living in the way the people of Israel did. Yeah, and so there's there's this tension there, and so that's why Paul keeps writing about the law. It's because that's the world they're trafficking in, the Jews, and they're, that's what they're trying to force onto some of the things that that Jesus fulfilled, that he says he fulfilled in the law, uh, that no longer need to be enforced on on Greek people. Why the whole Jew first then the Greek thing? Why was that matter? Why do you have to call that out in order? Uh, I think you know that answer. I don't know. So I, 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 my mind's a little whack. All right, all right. So it's a little whack because all right, the Jesus came first? to the Jews. Yeah, he, he his that was God's chosen God's people. Chosen yeah. people. That okay. was the that was the avenue through which he saved the whole world. Yeah, is the family of Abraham. So Jesus came to the Jews first. And then the message went out to the Gentiles. Okay. Jesus says it. That's why Paul just repeats it because he is the, he's the Jewish Messiah. He's yeah. the anointed. He's a descendant of David. He's all, all the promises of the Old Testament. That's how God said he was going to save the world. And that's, the, that's what Jesus fulfills all of them. It doesn't mean that he likes them more. No, I, I mean, know. Yeah. That, that yeah. was his it's plan of salvation, perf- though. But I mean, that's, and that, that yeah. makes sense. And that's really what Paul's saying is, hey, Y'all are all sinners and you're all hypocrites. You say you have the law, but actually you're not even following it. Right, yeah. You know, even though you have the law of God and you're supposed to light to the world, everyone's, everyone's guilty, but God has rescued everyone through Jesus. Oh, yo, there's so much in the, the, This is going to be interesting going through Romans. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how it's going to work each day being, I mean, just, yeah. it's, it's like, it feels so dense. Yeah. It's harder to do three or four chapters at a time on it is. Than, it, than it was like Acts or yeah. Luke, where, where you're covering some narrative ground. Yeah. Uh, that's not to say you can't read three chapters of Romans. I'm yeah. just saying if, if you're trying to do bread or let it work in your heart, yeah. it's better to have... And I'm glad, I, I say that to say I'm glad we're only doing one, uh, one day. I'm sure I'm going to mess up yeah. and get off track and have to catch up, but... I'm doing it. Anything else before I move on well, from? Well, I just, I just think just to encourage everybody, um, if you are taking notes, if you are using your journal, uh, maybe go back and just read just a couple pages from, uh, from Luke or from Acts, because really these concepts were there. Yeah. This is a diff. This is a letter. It has a lot of theology in it, but Jesus and Paul have already been saying a lot of these things already. And then Paul's really spelling it out for the church right here. But it'll help you to just remember, you, you really do know a lot already. Yep. You know more than you think you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Psalm 5. Oh, Psalm 5. I was going to say, maybe we should end by reading it, but I don't know. It is maybe a little longer. Yeah, we're getting long and people are driving and or riding and we're, we're already getting oh, a little bit Psalm 5 we fits say. well. With, Go ahead. With this. I mean, the, the title over it is Lead Me in Your Righteousness, mm. a Psalm of David. Okay. So let's just go ahead and read it. We'll do it. All right. We'll stay faithful. How do you want to do this? Just, just one of us read it? 
Go for it, Ted. Oh, goodness gracious. Or, oh, are your eyes... Or do you have no, weak, no, weak well, eyes? No, no, not that. <laughs> just, you know, public <laughs> reading in front of people. It's oh. all good. All right. So this... Rachel, you almost there? You're getting, okay, she's getting sorry, there. She's I flipping. I caught on the... It's almost in it, the it. middle of the Bible there. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> kidding. It. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so this is Psalm 5. Uh, it says, the, the title is, Lead Me in Your Righteousness. To the choir master, for the flutes, a psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you, I do pray. Hey, if I mess up, I'm sorry. You're going to have to stop me to correct me. You're doing great. Sometimes. No, I know. you're not. Uh, it says, give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for you, do, for to you I do pray. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. E- evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors... Is that how you say that? Mm-hmm. Uh, the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. For they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge uh, in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread the protection and spread your protection over them that those who love uh, your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with uh, favor as with a shield. Amen. Yeah. Anything you want to say on that? I mean, that's, dude, it got crazy in there for a second. A lot of the Psalms do. It's usually going one way, and then you're like, oh, hard yeah. turn, David. That's exactly how Romans feels right now, though. Yeah. It's, it is everyone is terrible, and you are too, but... But there's good news. But, yeah. but yeah. because of God's grace and favor, you're rescued, so... Awesome. Well, we made it through. Yep. Excited to see what Romans has in store for us. Abrahamic righteousness. Abrahamic righteousness. That's what's ahead. All right, well... We'll catch you next week with some more Rachel's Abrahamic excited. righteousness. <laughs> you Rachel's excited. I'm like, Abrahamic what? Abrahamic righteousness. What about normal righteousness? We'll, we'll talk about that too. Oh, nice. We're going to get into it. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Bible reading recap. We hope these conversations are helpful as we all seek Jesus and his word. Listen, if you go to clearcreekresources.org, we have a lot more resources dedicated to helping you study the Bible. Because when we open the Bible, God opens his mouth. Let's continue to seek God in scripture together. We'll see you next week.